she did not return, but he went searching for her along the usual bike route, but could not find her and called to the police. Several witnesses saw Tara riding a bicycle around 11.30am. Some also saw a white or grey pickup truck following closely behind. She and her bike have never been found. It's widely believed she was kidnapped, as 20 years later, a disturbing polaroid picture of a young woman and a boy, gagged and bound, was found in a store parking lot in Florida. Tara's mother was convinced this woman was her daughter, and noted that a scar on the woman's leg was identical to the one Tara had. Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and concluded this was Tara, but a second analysis by the Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed. An FBI analysis was inconclusive. The woman who found the photo said it was in a parking space at the Junior Food Store at Port St. Joe, Florida where a white windowless Toyota cargo van had been parked when she arrived at the store. She said the van was being driven by a man with a moustache who appeared to be in his thirties. Relatives of a nine-year-old boy, Michael Henley, also of New Mexico, came forward, believing that he was the boy shown in the photo. Michael was last seen on a camping trip with his father in April 1988 and his remains were discovered in June 1990 in the Zuni Mountains, seven miles from the campsite. Police believe that Michael wandered off and gotten lost as the cause of death was ruled as hypothermia. They did not believe he was the boy in the photo. FBI analysis was again inconclusive. In 2013, a man named Henry Brown made a deathbed confession to police. He said shortly after Tara's disappearance, he had been in the basement of a man named Lawrence Ramiro Jr. While there, he noticed what appeared to be a young woman's body wrapped in a blue tarp and buried in a makeshift grave. Romero, a man named Dave Silver, and another man told Henry the body was Tara's. They said that on the day of her disappearance, they, along with a fourth man named Leroy Chavez, were in a truck when they noticed her riding a bike. While trying to get her attention, they accidentally hit her, then abducted and raped her. When Tara threatened to go to the police, Romero stopped her. They were apparently able to get away with the murder, as Romero's father was sheriff at the time. He and the other parents allegedly helped to cover up the crime. Henry also told investigators he believed they later dumped Tara's body in a pond near one of their houses, and her bike had been disposed of at a junkyard. Another man also came forward, saying that one of the suspects had confessed to him as well. Romero Jr. later committed suicide in 1991. However, Tara's body has not been found.
cosmetic company had employed only female staff. They had nothing to do with the job offer made to Emanuela. Other teenagers had also been approached by a man who was offering similar jobs. After the phone call, Emanuela and two friends, Maria and Raffaella, went to the bus stop around 7.30 p.m. First, Maria and then Raffaella got on two different buses, while Emanuela didn't get on the bus because it was too crowded. She said she would wait for the next one. This is the last reliable sighting of Emanuela. A disappearance was linked to the disappearance of another Roman teenager, Mirella Gregori, who disappeared the month before and was also never found. Three days later, several phone calls were received from a 16-year-old boy named Pierre Luigi. He said he and his girlfriend had met two girls in Roman Square. One of them was selling cosmetics, had a flute with her, and said her name was Barbara. Pierluigi also reported, when asked to play the flute, Barbara refused because she had to wear glasses, which she did not like. These calls appeared to be reliable to the family. Pierluigi refused to help any further or to meet in person. Several more days later, there was a man, Mario, who claimed to be the owner of a bar in Rome, along the route that Emanuela usually took to go to the music school. Mario claimed to see a man and two girls selling cosmetics, one of whom claimed to be from Venice and was called Barbarella. However, when asked about the height of the girl, Mario hesitated and then said, she's quite tall, but Emanuela was only five feet two. In the background, a second voice was heard saying, no more. Mario said Barbara had told him she had voluntarily left home, but she would return at the end of the summer for her sister's wedding. The family considered this to be impossible and lost faith in the phone calls from Mario and Pierre Luigi. Days after the disappearance, a young woman described very similar to Emanuela was seen talking to a man who drove a green BMW. He was never located. There are theories that this case was linked to the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II. The Pope had publicly asked for those responsible for Emanuela's disappearance to come forward. An American man called the Vatican Press Office, claiming to be holding Emanuela hostage. He asked for the release of Mehmet Ali Aja. A Turkish terrorist who had shot the Pope a couple of years earlier and was serving a life sentence. No evidence was ever found proving Emanuela was actually held hostage. The next case is Virginia Carpenter. Mary Virginia Carpenter was 21 years old when she went missing from Texas in 1948. On June 1st, Virginia left her home in Texarkana and took a train to Denton where she was planning to take a summer course at the Texas State College for Women. Virginia checked in a black steamer trunk containing most of her possessions. During the trip, Virginia befriended Marjorie Webster, a middle-aged school teacher who was also enrolling at the college. The train arrived in Denton at 9 p.m. Virginia and Marjorie agreed to share a taxi to the campus. When they got to the college, Marjorie was dropped off. But Virginia realized she'd forgotten to pick up her trunk and asked the taxi driver, 
Zachary to take a back to the train station. A station employee said a trunk had not arrived yet. Zachary offered to pick it up and deliver it to her the next morning. Virginia gave him the claim ticket, signing her name and her dormitory room number. Zachary then dropped her off at her dorm at 9.30 p.m. According to Zachary, Virginia approached two young men standing next to a cream-colored convertible and asked them what they were doing here. The following morning, Zachary retrieved the trunk from the station, returned to the dorm and left the trunk on the front lawn, where it would remain for two days. On June 4th, Virginia's boyfriend, Kenny, called her mother as he hadn't heard from Virginia for three days. Virginia's mother then reported her missing. Zachary was investigated and cleared of any involvement. He had a criminal record, but fully cooperated and passed seven lie detector tests. No evidence could be found to incriminate him. Zachary's wife provided an alibi, telling police he arrived home at 10 p.m. that day. The owner of the cream-colored convertible was found. It belonged to a young man whose girlfriend was a student at the college. They were parked together there that night. They remembered seeing two young men walking around outside the vehicle did not witness their interaction with Virginia. Two days after her disappearance, a gas station attendant thought he saw Virginia in the town of Aubrey. She was inside a yellow convertible with two young men and another woman. On June 11th, a ticket agent saw a young woman resembling Virginia at a bus station into Queen, Arkansas. She had just gotten off a bus from Texarkana and looked nervous. She left the station with a man in his mid-twenties. Shortly after they left, the ticket agent said she received a phone call from a woman asking if a Miss Virginia Carpenter was there. Over the following decades, several more sightings were reported. Unconfirmed. Nine years later, in 1957, a taxi driver, Zachary, was charged with attempted rape. The charges were dropped after the victim did not want to prosecute. Later, Zachary's ex-wife came forward, claiming he was abusive and had forced her to fabricate an alibi for him the night of Virginia's disappearance. Instead of returning home at 10 p.m., she now said that Zachary arrived sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. Zachary and his wife had moved to Midland, but he would make a five-hour drive to Denton every year just to pick up a copy of the local newspaper whenever they published anniversary articles about Virginia's case. However, there was still no solid evidence to implicate Zachary, and he died in 1984. Virginia's disappearance occurred two years after the unsolved serial killings, known as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. Virginia lived there at the time, and she knew three of the victims. A theory suggested they were linked but no connection was ever found between these murders and Virginia's case. The next case is Branson Perry. In 2001, 20-year-old Branson Perry disappeared from his home in Skidmore, Missouri. He was 5 at 9 with blonde hair. He was a black belt in Abkido and suffered from Tachycardia, where the heart beats too fast. His father, Bob, was in the hospital and was scheduled to be released in a few days. Branson had called a female friend, Gina, to come help him tidy up the house before his father returned. Branson told Gina he was going to take some jumper cables to the shed outside his house and then run out for a bit. 
she was very out of character. After contacting Marion's bank, Sally learned that her mother, or perhaps someone else, had been draining her bank account for maximum daily limits over August and September 1997. Sally then They 